Hi everybody, welcome to Cooperative UK's AGM. It's our first online, fully online AGM. You know we've done it in a sort of hybrid fashion in the past. I hope you're all well in these strange times. Usually at the annual general meeting, I introduce the people on the platform. But here today, I'm all on my lonesome in my own house. Like many uh, Cooperatives UK staff and many of you, I'm working from home. I'm told there's a great semiotics about the backdrop that people have when they uh, work from home. Some of my colleagues who work in the university tell me about the cultural significance, you know, the sort of semiotics of uh, bookshelves and backdrops. Well, today I'm wearing uh, social enterprise people we were pleased to know. Social Enterprise produced William Morris Ty from Margate. Uh, behind me, you'll see uh, some nice pottery from the People's Republic of Stokescroft in Bristol and some William Morris posters. Uh, between them, you'll spot, if you're very lucky, on my, over my shoulder there, a little postcard of the Rochdale Pioneers, of course, absolutely essential for every cooperative home. So, uh, without more ado, let me tell you who, who is going to be involved in the meeting. Uh, Cooptives UK's uh, interim secretary is Emma Laycock, and she's working from Holyoke House. And as you know, in these situations, for the last decade at least, we've had our secretary general, Ed Mayo, with us for these events. Ed left the society uh, a month ago, and I'm sure uh, on behalf of all of our members, we would all like to wish him the very best of good fortune in his new role and to thank him for the immense contribution that he made to the cooperative movement here in the UK. Ed, if you're watching, thanks so much. It's been great working with you and we'd like to wish you all the very best for the future. What a, what a period this has been. I mean, COVID-19 uh, has been an astonishing uh, event in our country. But one thing I can say without fear of contradiction, that the cooperative sector has shone and risen to the challenge that that terrible virus has produced. I think it would be invidious to single out any individual cooperative because I think the entire sector from the largest to the smallest has gone above and beyond to deliver goods and services for their members. It's been an astonishing period and I pay tribute to every single cooperative in this country. And I'm absolutely honored to be the chair of the organization that represents them at this time. We at Cooperatives UK are obviously fighting on behalf of our members and the wider co-op and social enterprise movement, working with partners to ensure we can have the biggest impact that we can possibly have. We want to ensure that co-ops are not missing out on any government support, on any funding opportunities, or any policy activity. We're having conversation with funders to secure for the sector and our advice team. And I think this uh, crisis has demonstrated the true value of the work that they do. Uh, have gone above and beyond to deliver a tremendous range of information, advice and support online. And I thank our members for the participation and the role they've played in joining with us in those activities. The level and scale of engagement with us online during this crisis has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you again. Now, normally, uh, you know, if, if, this, if we were in Rochdale, like we should have been at this time, uh, you know, we would be getting ready for the Cooperative Awards evening. We'd be all looking forward to a fantastic Congress and the beginning of Cooperative Sport Night. Fortunately, sadly, but fortunately, we've been able to roll over all those activities uh, for next year. So co Congress next year will be in Rochdale and we will be celebrating our 151st anniversary of the Cooperative Union uh, this time next year. There was one organisation, however, that we felt we still ought to pay tribute to because it's a very significant birthday for them this year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, cooperators, today uh, we're making a special award to the ILO Co-ops Unit. Uh, founded in uh, London, the second Congress of the ILO in 1920, they have served the international cooperative movement for a hundred years. And we think it would be wrong not to mark that situation. 
it's thanks to them that we have the international definition of what a cooperative is, recommendation 193, which in many countries around the world underpins the legal framework for cooperatives. So ILO, co-op unit, happy birthday. And thank you for the work you do supporting cooperatives around the world and supporting the 280 million people around the world who either work for or work in cooperative enterprises. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on, we now have to do a bit of technical stuff. So this is where I'll be a bit more scripted and have to stick to the script, otherwise Emma will be giving me a hard time. So first of all, we have to take the attendance. We need to confirm the attendance to ensure that we are quiet. Emma, is anybody actually out there? They are. We have around 59 attendees, so I confirm we are quiet. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. I need to let you know that the meeting is being recorded. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it doesn't mean you can have another go uh, if you get it wrong. Uh, like me, I, I, you know, my, all my indiscretions and misspoke speaking is going to be uh, recorded for posterity. Uh, but it's, it's, it's on a more serious point, it's to make sure that we've got a full record and minutes of the meeting. They're voting and asking questions. There are going to be several votes today. And we'll be using two methods of voting. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Emma in a second to explain how the voting will work and also how we will conduct the questions and answer sessions. Emma. Hello. So in terms of the, um, the voting, I'll come on to that in a moment, but just a little bit of housekeeping. So just if you haven't worked it through yet, if you make sure that you're using your speaker view um, at all times, and just to note that if you're on an iPad um, or a tablet, sometimes it can take a little bit longer to catch up with the, uh, the camera that's on screen, but you should still be able to hear everything. Uh, the chat function, just so you know, that can only be used to chat with um, Cooperatives UK staff, so you can't chat um, with, other, with other members, um, I'm afraid. If you have any issues, uh, technical issues that you need us uh, to know about, then please do put them in, um, in the chat. If you have any questions related to any of the information here today, use the question and answer button uh, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We're also live streaming um, on YouTube. They can ask questions, uh, but they can't vote. Um, again, if you're on YouTube, uh, you're about 22 seconds behind uh, the Zoom. So just bear that in mind if you're asking questions, you might wanna do it um, a, little bit, um, a little bit earlier. So in terms of voting, uh, we'll be using two types of voting today. Uh, we have a ballot vote um, because we are having, uh, we are undertaking a, a rule amendment, hopefully. The ballot vote um, means that we have to use our uh, weighted voting arrangements. Uh, details of those are on the website if anyone's interested. When we come to resolution one, um, which will be the ballot vote, we want you to use the chat button at that point and you'll be um, asked to insert the words for, against, or abstain in the chat. But we'll remind you about all of this when, uh, when it comes to it. Um, once you press enter on the chat, that means that you've voted and you have 90 seconds to place your vote. And because the chat button only speaks to those uh, Cops UK members of staff, it's, it's totally confidential and the other members can't see um, how you voted. All the other votes will be uh, taken using a poll, which is the equivalent of a show of hands um, and that will come up on your screen and again you'll be able to choose for, against or abstain and once you click your vote's registered um, and you can't change your mind and you'll have around 45 seconds to vote um, on that. The results of the poll votes will come up on screen immediately whereas the results of the ballot vote will tell you them at the end of the meeting because we need a little bit more time to count them up um, and um, align with the, the weighted voting. So in terms of asking questions, um, if you'd like to ask a question, then please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Um, <coughs> everyone can see all of the questions that you ask. We'll either answer the question in the room or you might receive a response to your question uh, within the question and answer box. If you read a question that you particularly like and want to hear the answer to, you can press the upvote button. And then lastly, um, if you want to second a resolution, we'll ask for seconders, 
then if in the participants button you can uh, raise your hand then I'll be able to see um, that you want to, uh, to second any of the resolutions. There's one last thing, you can ask questions if you are on YouTube, you just need to use the YouTube chat function for that. Any questions on YouTube will then be added to the Zoom question and answer um, by our colleague Layla. So if you see lots of questions coming from Layla, they're not all from her, they're from YouTube. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Emma. So that was all a bit complicated, wasn't it? But hopefully, uh, as we go forward, it'll become a bit more transparent and a bit clearer. Uh, just for people watching on YouTube, if you want to ask questions about things like this, you're in the wrong meeting. Uh, the, meet, the group meeting was last week or the week before. Central England have already had their meeting and so have mid counties. So if you want to ask questions about beans, We've got members who sell beans, but that's not us. That's another cooperative altogether. Uh, so uh, moving on, uh, we've our first item, formal item of business, is the approval of the minutes of the AGM held on the 21st of June 2019. I would like to formally propose this. Can I ask for a seconder? You okay, Nick? Uh, uh, yes. Now, in, in, I take it, Emma, we've got a seconder. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see who it was. <laughs> we, we've just had some questions as to whether or not we can uh, see um, people on iPads have the participants button. So if you're on an iPad and you want to second any of the motions, then you can. Um, you may just button um, if that's the case. Um, but we do have a seconder. The first one there was Mark Simmons. Excellent, thank you very much, Mark. So the, 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 uh, the motion is before you that we approve the minutes of the AGM held on the 21st of June, 2019, seconded by Mark Simmons. Uh, instructions on how to vote should be on your screens now. Hey Nick, I can confirm that that resolution has been passed. Excellent. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, moving on then. Now we've got that out of the way. Our first uh, piece of business is the fact that we've undertaken a major piece of work on our rule book. Uh, it's a, it would be a bit rich, wouldn't it, for a, co a cooperative organisation that promotes cooperatives and tells them what their rule book should state if we don't have an up to date rule book of our own. So our next item of business relates to our rule book amendment. We're going to hear from Mark Simmons, chair of our governance committee, who is proposing this resolution. Uh, our society secretary, Zena King, who's currently on maternity leave, and I'm pleased to report the mother of a lovely little boy, uh, is also here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Zena led the work of the board on the review of the rule book. Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Okay with me, Mark. Great. Okay, so uh, as chair of the governance committee, I am proposing uh, resolution one, which I shall read out now. Uh, rule book amendment to a complete amendment of the rules of the society, substituting the current rules with the rules marked X and made available with this notice and at www.uk.coop forward slash AGM. So if you're looking at those rules, they've got a big X at the top of them. 
The reasons that we're proposing these changes are, um, one, to ensure that the rule book reflects changes in legislation and best practice, and two, to improve the accessibility of those rules and transparency for members. I do want to stress that there have been no significant changes to rights and responsibilities, and that the proposed rules are a result of a prolonged process involving the Crocters UK Board, the Governance Committee, the Financial Conduct Authority, and also with the help of some of our larger members as well. Uh, noteworthy changes, which are also detailed in a little bit more detail than I'm going to uh, do now in the notice of this meeting, are summarised as follows. So in line with our own updated model rules for societies, the new rules give us the ability to raise share capital from our members. There is an increase in the borrowing limit from 4 million to 10 million, again, just uh, as in our standard models. Clarification on the process for the expulsion of a member. Simplification of the process for members to call a general meeting. An increase in the required majority for a rule change from two thirds to 75% again in line with our standard models and finally we've removed the need for a fixed year review of board composition okay happy to take questions clarifications uh, on the resolution so before we go for any further we've got opportunity there for anybody who, who needs to or wants to to ask any questions of uh, mark and Zena about that process so the floor is open for questions. Just while we're waiting for questions, I feel like I should confirm that Zena actually had a little girl. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> goodness she me. might make an I'll appearance. Oh, she yeah. might make an appearance soon. Yeah. I'll do a bit of product placement while I'm waiting. I'm having a glass of cup of revolver coffee. Excellent. So if anyone has any questions, if you can use the question and answer box, um, we'll wait a little bit longer to see if anyone has any questions, um, because obviously on uh, YouTube we're about 20 seconds behind, so we'll just wait a little bit longer. Okay, we do have one question. Uh, in fact, we've got two, so here we go. Um, from Catherine Parrish, how would that affect each co-op's own rules? Should be should we all be reviewing? Um, I think I can probably maybe take that one. Um, we would we would probably suggest that that all societies should review their rules on a on a regular basis. Uh, we haven't really um, done a, a review of our rules since about 2015, and um, so I think you should just have a think about when you when you last updated your rules, and all colleges would do that. We do have some new model rules and we can absolutely help any co-ops to, um, to update their rules using those if they want to. Um, we also have a question from Jenny de Villiers who asks, uh, Mark, perhaps you can take this one. Could you elaborate on uh, board composition? Uh, yeah, so our board composition is, is a mixture of uh, seats allocated to our larger members uh, seats allocated to uh, particular uh, sectors and also types of cooperatives. So, for instance, mixed ownership uh, co-ops. Uh, we've preserved that from our old rules into our new rules. So, while the, uh, the the final change I talked about removed the need for a fixed year review of board composition, which is where we would look at that and say, does this board composition reflect uh, our current membership? Um, we haven't actually, as, as part of this rule change, made any change. So our last review uh, recommended no changes to that. And then we preserved that, what it was in the old rules, into the new rules. Uh, but again, we're, we're going to, as, as part of good governance, that will be reviewed down the years and may change in future years. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers Jenny's question. Might be might have to make Jenny, 20 seconds for, for confirmation. <laughs> Jenny, just let me know if you need um, any more um, clarification on that question. Uh, we currently don't have any more questions, so I'm going to, oh, we do, we have one more here from um, Sean Wellens. Um, he's asking around the uh, review of the rules uh, or the model rules and the outcomes that we expect from this and when do we expect to publish the new models. Um, we did hope that the new models would be ready to publish um, around April, May time, but actually we've, we kind of put that work on hold 
um, whilst we were providing advice um, around COVID. Um, that hopefully um, will start up again in a couple of weeks' time when our furloughed members of staff come back. Um, so I'd hope to be able to publish the new society models, I would say, um, around end of July. Thanks, Emma. So we we uh, don't have any more questions. So um, if no, we, don't, we don't need yeah, yeah. Think going, going, gone. I'm, I'm sure there'll be uh, questions about other matters as we go further on. So the resolution uh, before us is to approve uh, the complete amendment of the rules of the society, substituting the current rules with the rules marked X. Can I ask for a second? We have a second of uh, Harry Kenny. Oh, thank you. Excellent. It's lovely to hear that Harry's on, on the line. So it's now time to vote. As Emma mentioned earlier, this vote has to be conducted using a ballot, so we will not be using a poll vote this time. To vote, please enter the words for, against or abstain in the chat and then press enter on your keyboard or keypad. Once you have voted, you can then go back and change. Once you have voted, you can't go back. I'll say that again. Once you have voted, you can't go back and change it. You should be able to see the chat button on your screen. For this vote, we're giving you 90 seconds to place your vote. So you've got 90 seconds to go to the chat, uh, enter the words for, against, or abstain, and then press enter. I'll, I'll just product place a bit more revolver coffee. Hey, thank, thank you, you very thank okay. you very much everybody for thank taking you. part yeah. in that vote that vote is now closed uh, the next items of business relate to our 2019 annual report and financial statements we're going to hear from michael shepherd the finance manager and then our audit partner at kpmg will baker and finally from john atherton our head of management uh, sorry our head of membership who will speak on behalf of the management team uh, we'll hear from Michael and Will and then take questions and then you'll have another opportunity for questions after John has spoken. So Michael Shepard will be start by outlining, outline, I'm breaking this brain in for a friend at the moment. So Michael Shepard will start by outlining our financial results for 2019. Michael. Thank you Chair. Can you hear me Nick? Yes, thank you Michael. I'll, ta I'll take that as a good thing. So thank you Chair. It gives me great pleasure in our 150th year to present the financial statements for Cooperatives UK for the year ending 31st of December 2019. There'll be time for questions later in the AGM. The statements include reference to COVID-19, which entailed extra work before the audit and council finally signed off. We've included information on the risks and actions Cooperatives UK have taken in relation to the pandemic, and we will continue to monitor the effects going forward. Next slide. All the financial data is available in the annual report, which was distributed to members and is also available on the website at www.uk.coop. The page numbers I'll give are in relation to this document, the picture above.
these accounts are for the year ending 31st of December 2019. Next slide, please. We posted a pre-tax surplus of £35,631, which was down on the previous year by approximately £20,000, but this was expected and budgeted for. Our cash and investment positions improved from £1.7 million to £2.2 million due to movement on debtors and investment gains. Moving on to our equity investments. Next slide, please, Paul. As part of our pilot um, in equity investments, in 2019, the increase by 887,000. Cope UK were allocated a pot of money to buy community shares in community businesses. This is the third year of that project, and we've been able to invest in 25 businesses to date. This is shown on page 37 of the annual report with the investment values of each. Corp UK will hold these shares and each year we do a measurement for impairment and we've secured funding to continue this work. Next slide, please. Page 37 shows the 10 societies we invested in 2019 and all the other investments to date. These are funds where Corps UK act as a conduit for money coming into the sector on a pilot basis. We can't therefore be sure that the investments will remain on our balance sheet and that the value will stay the same. It's an excellent initiative and one we're very proud of uh, doing and we've uh, tried to separate it in our annual account so the members can get a true financial position year to year of our actual accounts. So if you think we've actually got hundreds of thousands of pounds of profit on our balance sheet, it's just not the case, unfortunately. But please be assured we take every step to ensure the governance, the good practice and the audit contact to handle these monies is appropriate. Moving on to our accounts. Income remained consistent and in line with previous years and with our expectations. Our actual pre-tax surplus on ordinary activities was just over £35,000, which included um, a good return from our investments of £42,000. Next slide. As part of our... I think, sorry, I've missed one. Hold on. Inc. So it's me. As part of our strategy to diverse our income, the subscription percentage of our total income has decreased year on year, and it's down from 43% in 2018 to 41% in 2019. Chargeable services have seen a steady growth in income over the last few years as we continue to develop advice services to meet the movement's needs. Projects that meet the wider objectives of the Corps UK are a large part of our work and development initiatives remain at the heart of what we do. We continue to seek partnership funding for the work we do and we have had success in securing funding from community initiatives and meeting our mission of Promote, Develop and Unite. Next slide, Paul. Expenditure, not talking about expenditure, personality would you expect is our biggest cost and it would be remiss of me not to go on record to say a big thank you to all the staff at Corps UK for their dedication and hard work during 2019. Establishment costs are up by 101,000 as we're continuing to invest in all the oak house and we now provide IT services support to our tenants as we continue to aim for full occupancy. Holy Oak House letting income has been disappointing this year and we've seen a year-on-year -year decrease of 7% after an increase of 9% in 2018. This is due to a, a large tenant leaving and the space being vacant for an extended period and it's an area we continue to work on. We continue to invest in the building and we're proud that it remains as a centre of excellence of the cooperative movement. 
We're proud to report we retain the fair tax mark for our accounts and Note 9 gives all the information on the tax position and it starts at page 38. Moving on to the balance sheet, funds for projects are generally received in advance with project income being held on the balance sheet as deferred income and we recognise it in line with the cost of the work done. As per the accounts and this summary, this concludes my presentation to the AGM of the 2019 statutory accounts and rest assured my team and I will continue to look after your money. Thank you for your patience and for listening. At this point, I would like to pass you over to our audit partner, Will Baker, who has been appointed as our audit partner in replacement for Nicola Quayle, who has moved on to a new role within Corporate UK. But before I do, we would like to thank Nicola for her work and commitment to Corps UK over the years. And with that, let me pass you on to Will Baker of KPMG. Will Baker. Hi, Will. Are you there? Hi. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Will Baker. I'm an audit partner with KPMG. Um, and I'm going to refer you to pages 23 to 24 of the annual reports and financial statements, which is our independent auditors report to the members of Cooperatives UK Limited. I signed that audit report on the 30th of April uh, 2020. I'm only going to read out the opinion part of our full report, and that's found at the top of page 23. So our opinion. We have audited the financial statements of Cooperatives UK Limited, open brackets, the society, close brackets, for the year ended 31 December 2019, which comprised the income statements, balance sheet, cash flow statements, statements of changes in equity and related notes, including the accounting policies in note one. In our opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view in accordance with UK accounting standards, including FRS 102, the financial reporting standard applicable in the UK and Republic of Ireland, of the state of the society's affairs as at the 31st of December 2019, and of the income and expenditure of the society for the year then ended, and comply with the requirements of the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act 2014. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Michael. We now have an opportunity for colleagues to ask any questions they may have about the financial report and the financial statements. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I have a as well, a question statement here, Michael. Um, it says there appears to be an error in the 2019 liabilities figure um, with a question mark. I don't know if you need any more information in order to be able to respond to that. I think I think I'll need more information. Can I? Okay, there's a question from John Laker. John, can you add a little bit more information? Um, so that we can respond to that question. And if anyone else has any other questions in the meantime, then do add them into the question and answer box. Okay, just while we're waiting for John to put in some additional information, we have um, another question from Heather Richardson. This is directed towards Will, but um, Will, Michael, um, I'm sure you can say which, um, maybe you both want to respond. To what extent did you consider the impacts of COVID-19 in your audit, please? Will, it do would... you want to go first? And then maybe Michael can give some more detail specific to COTS UK. Uh, we consider all factors that um, affect the numbers up until the time at which we sign our audit report. So all the factors which affect post volunteers events are considered up until uh, the 30th of April 2020. Michael, do you have anything to add specifically about what we included in the uh, in the accounts with regards to um, to COVID-19? 
And we actually did extra work looking at adding uh, COVID-19 information in because the accounts weren't signed off till just after the, uh, the pandemic had started. So we did, we actually did more work. If it had been a couple of weeks before, we could have got them signed off, but we had to do work in general anyway. Okay, Heather, hopefully that answered um, your question. We have another question from uh, John Daly uh, from Scott Mid. He asked, what is the likely impact on investment income uh, moving forward um, following the crisis? Michael? On mute. I'm unmuted. I actually looked at our investments last week and they are actually at the same par value. A lot of the investments are in other societies anyway, so it's a pound for a pound. The only investments we've got is with Royal London, and that was £250,000 in, in about last July. And I looked at it last week and it was 248000 and we'd also got four grand worth of um, dividend. So as of last week, it was it was still on the value with what the accounts say at the end of last year. So we're hopefully the, we haven't got a lot of um, money money invested in risk. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, John has come back to us. So he he says on the slide that you showed, which hopefully you can um, you can still see, Michael. Um, that there appears to be an error. I'm not sure if that means that the other the error is on the slide or it's different to what's actually in the accounts. I think the error is on the slide at number number eleven. I've put an extra two instead of a. a yeah, the liabilities for this year should be one seven one zero seven nine zero as per the accounts, not one two seven one zero seven nine zero as per the slide. Completely my fault. Thanks, Michael. Hopefully, John, that answers your question. Well done, um, John. Just to go back on um, investments, um, Liam McLeod has asked, is there a list available of the investments um, made by COPS UK? You're on mute, Michael. Probably the best way, to be honest. Uh, page 36, we've got the investment summary at the bottom of that page. Is it specifically the ones in other corp societies or the one um, that we invest with Royal London? Because if it's um, one with Royal London, we have got a list of them. Um, is that something that we can share? Um, I don't. I don't see why not. We can share it. It is just a general fund, so I mean, I can share the information. It's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Liam's saying if we can share that would be great. So we'll find a way to share that following um, the AGM. Okay. Um, there's a question from Austin Cordasco, Michael, which is um, he didn't quite catch what you said about the fair tax mark. So can you just confirm whether or not Cops UK is compliant? Yes. Completely. Thank you. Um, we have um, a question from Harry Kearney. It may well be, um, if it's all right, Harry, that I'll keep this question until after uh, John Atherton has done his presentation. Uh, the question is about um, what impact we think COVID-19 might have on membership retention and the future impact on membership. So as we had, have, um, as we have the head of membership taking questions in about 10 minutes, it, um, we'll just keep that question um, for John, if that's okay. Is there any more questions that anyone wants to ask before um, we um, we bring John on for his presentation? It doesn't look like it. John, if you're ready, we'll spotlight your video now. Do we do we, do we have to? Um accept the accounts no we'll do that following john's okay presentation. sorry yeah there's a resolution coming mike don't, uh, don't worry hello i'm john atherton um head of membership and events um i'll be sharing our impacts through 2019 uh, and just to add my own best wishes to ed and his contribution over the years 
uh, not least uh, doing delivering these excellent presentations every year. So instead of Ed, you've got me, sadly, for some. Um, and also, uh, as Nick couldn't uh, give best wishes to himself, I will give best wishes to Nick Matthews for, for being chair. Uh, and I will miss particularly uh, the check-ins he gave to me over the last few years on, on how things were going at Cox UK. So good luck, Nick. Uh, next slide, if I can. So just to uh, start off with our, so I'll, uh, there should be a slide on coronavirus, but it's not there. So I'm going to go with what I think should be there rather than what is there. Um, just to start really with uh, a, a quick point really on the coronavirus and the effect that it's had on the organisation, because I think it's apt to do that, even though we're mostly talking about 2019. Um, I think for me, and I can say this because myself, I was on adoption leave when, when it all started. So I can say this really without blushing because it, it's about my colleagues, not about myself. But I was very concerned when I came back from adoption leave on the sort of crisis would, that would be unfolding within the organisation. And it's fair to say I came back to an organisation that, that whose business continuity planning had kicked in. You know, we were delivering everything from home pretty much we we had the technology the infrastructure and were you know pretty much fully operational from a home working situation and the mt when i came back were rapidly making decisions in a fast changing and dynamic environment so that made me proud uh, to come back to we were putting members first as an organization um, we were rapidly interpreting government legislation policy and advice we were lobbying the government and, as Nick said, funders to ensure that cooperatives had the support that, that was there and were, um, were at the table in those conversations. And we were on point for our members. The advice team in particular, uh, both HR and governance, were, were there taking inquiries from members every day. Uh, we were delivering webinar briefings and newsletter briefings uh, to all of our members and beyond to reassure them and give them practical advice and guidance about the situation. And sometimes we were giving, consoling our members, sometimes our role, there, there is nothing to do. We just have to help our members and through difficult times and, and to console them and to reassure them. And we did that as well. And within the organisation itself, we made some hard choices. As was mentioned, we did furlough some of our colleagues. Um, we did change quite a lot of our activity, reorientated uh, and, and cancelled such as the Hive Assist programme, which was moved into uh, offering emergency support through this period. We cancelled events, we moved some online. Um, and, we, and as Nick mentioned, we will be uh, running Congress and Corps Fortnight, uh, hopefully in Rochdale next year. And we do thank our uh, sponsors for carrying on that sponsorship into next year. And so really just to say on that, my colleagues stepped up when it mattered. They always do. And despite their own worries and personal circumstances, they were there. And so a lot of the presentation I'm about to give is really about 2019 um, and the facts and figures of that. But it's always worth just looking beyond those facts and figures to the people who who were there at the end of the phone or behind the emails who are delivering the work every day at Cops UK. And, and they, they, are, they are there to support you as members through thick and thin. And we don't always get everything right and we don't always hit every milestone, but we are there when it counts. Um, so just to move on to our KPIs, this is an overview of our KPIs. So uh, as Michael has said, we uh, did hit our 5% increase um, in uh, income from non-retail society subscriptions. Uh, that was a big part of our strategy, um, both to uh, get more external funding to benefit the sector, and I'll come on to that a bit later, but also to increase our value add services are our charge for services and again we have done that and grown those over the last year we didn't hit our target um, for participation in governance i could be glib and say uh, you know your members are happy when they're quiet but uh, cops uk should be better than that and we should be best in class uh, so we do need to do more work and ensuring our members are fully engaged in in our governance we've we have had uh, increased member satisfaction and participation in our campaigning work. And I'll go into that a bit more detail later. And we have had increases in and take up of our advice services. And as I've mentioned, um, an increase in uh, charge services and funded projects by over 7.5%. And just to remember, this is for last year's um, figures. And so we are very aware of the unfolding situation and, and, and really checking in on our uh, charge services and other income 
through this next period. Can I have the next slide, please? I should also say uh, membership growth. We didn't quite hit this last year, but we did have an increase in non-member uh, communications uh, through our newsletter. And actually it's increased quite a bit since the start of the COVID situation as we took the call to give out quite a lot of advice for free uh, at the point of delivery and not just excluding it to, to paying members. And that has seen an up an increase in our in the number of non-members uh, receiving our communications and what we do hope um, is going into the future there will be a bit of uh, support from those those cooperatives that actually they really should be joining Co-op UK if we're, we've advised and supported them through this difficult period so hopefully we will see an uplift in membership in the future uh, but just moving on to promote we continue to obviously promote the cooperative model um, with the increasing interest and traction really at a local and evolved nation level we are pivoting more towards that sort of area so we've been working particularly in places like preston wigan plymouth with local authorities and local um like uh, anchor institutions to support cooperative development and of course we've been heavily involved in the greater manchester cooperative commission we do still lobby and of of course, we lobby nationally and at Westminster to ensure co-ops have a level playing field with other business forms. But a lot of that work is quite technical, quite behind the scenes and a lot around relationship building. And what I would say is that that quiet work that goes on constantly, uh, particularly by James Wright, keeps us really in good stead over the long term and through crises like this period. Uh, next slide, please. One specific example of that uh, is the £1 million we've saved uh, in FCA fees for not just our members, but the whole sector. And really, that's that's a year on year saving. We have also delivered 227 pieces of quality coverage in the media and our campaign, such as the £1 million owners campaign, which we launched last year, uh, was great in securing additional funding. So we've received funding from the Open Society Foundations to deliver a, quite a large project to grow uh, both the awareness and the actual number, hopefully, of worker-owned cooperatives and employee-owned businesses. And, that, and to be honest, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for promotional work and campaigning work around it, both to funders and to uh, the government. Next slide, please. Uh, our last year Cooperatives Fortnight film was viewed by 43,000 people and I believe we'll be showing this year's Cooperatives Fortnight film at the end of the AGM, so look forward to that. And just a quick nod to the, the, the comms team. Um, obviously we had planned to do Cooperatives Fortnight a particular way this way and they rapidly changed both the tone and, and, um, and everything really to do with it to make it relevant for the COVID situation. And you will see that, that with the, the hashtag keep cooperating and, and, and the film that we'll show later. Next slide, please. Next slide. We've supported 87 new cooperative startups over this last year in 2019. As any, as any advisor will tell you, uh, setting up a co-op is no easy feat. It can take up to two years. It takes a lot of hand-holding advice and support, which, which, our, which our team give all the time. And, and sometimes home truths. So actually not all the people we advise end up setting up a cooperative or, or even a business. And actually we pride ourselves on delivering impartial and professional, the best advice we can give to clients, irrespective of whether that ends up with them setting up a co-op or not. So behind that figure, there is a lot of work, a lot of reassurance, a lot of support uh, to those cooperatives. We have also uh, had 162 members take out our packages, our HR and contact package in particular, often dealing with very complex issues. And again, members don't always get the answers they want. They get the answers they need, but not necessarily the answers they want. And so getting a satisfaction rate of 97% um, rating is not just a testament to the quality of the advice and the professional level of advice. It's a testament to the care and consideration in giving that advice. Um, as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, our development unit and development work continues to grow uh, all the time, it feels like, um, and, has a, and has had a very healthy pipeline of projects with uh, fundraising surpassing 1.3 million through 2019. Uh, and we continue to focus on our core areas of community shares, local economic uh, development, and of course, cooperative development. Um, we've been focusing on specific sectors, such as our work on student housing co-ops, uh, our unfound program around platform and tech co-ops, um, and our work on the ownership hub, the work of ownership I mentioned previously. And, and through all that work, we've supported 253 of our, our member co-ops who've benefited from that advice and guidance, some of which delivered through our advice team, some of which delivered through those projects uh, uh, that have been externally funded. Next slide, please. And next slide again. Thank you. Um, so from a Unite point of view, we've uh, hosted 56 events last year for nearly 1,500 people. And again, most of those events focus on practical advice and guidance to cooperatives and really creating the spaces for them to connect and learn from each other. There's one thing talking to a professional advisor, but we also really pride ourselves on helping members bond, identify with other members and support and, and, and obviously cooperate with each other. And thankfully for, for me, this is one of my areas of work. We did pilot and test three webinars, which were very successful. And I'm very grateful for that because it meant when we this year switched over uh, most of our networking and some of our training to webinars, we already had the infrastructure and best practice in place. And it's fair to say the team have become quite a dab hand at running webinars. Uh, one example, uh, although we cancelled the physical work co-op weekend this year, uh, in a very short turnaround, we put that online into a virtual event and hosted 13 different workshops over two days um, for the work co-op weekend. And, and of course, we continue to work with our federal members and that they're that wider network of 4,300 co-ops who we support both on a policy level to government, um, but also increasingly actually through a particular more recent period through practical advice and guidance. Next slide, please. And just to say, this is a, a part uh, update on our work that some people may know as New Force. Um, but essentially our work supporting and working with the other infrastructure organisations, uh, both in Holyoke House and, and outside. And really just to say we, that work continues um, at a more tactical level. So we are still working with uh, the Cooperative Press College and others on um, shared services and support in that way, but also on more externally facing um, items. A great example of that is the More Than A Shop podcast that we're doing in collaboration with those partners. So if you haven't already, do, do download that podcast, which is a, a great example of collaborative working, but also reaching out to an audience beyond co-ops and, uh, and linking in topical things like climate change, um, mental health and well-being, food, and even music, I think one of the podcasts is on. So if you are interested, do, do download it, your favorite podcast uh, download service. Next slide, please. Onto the cooperative economy. Um, just to say, we weren't going to do the cooperative economy this last uh, this this year because of the the situation with uh, uh, the coronavirus. But uh, and I think if you move on to the next slide, hopefully you'll see the top. Oh no, it's not there. Um, the top ten, where uh, it's like I say, we weren't going to do the. Um, the, the co-op economy this year, but actually co-op group overtook John Lewis uh, as the largest cooperative in the UK. And so we thought, right, we'll better, we'll better release it. So we did release it and that will be out during cooperatives fortnight. And, you know, getting Stephen Morales on Sky News uh, is always a great thing for the co-op movement. So uh, just, just a nod there that it's, it's quite nice to see uh, the co-op group back, back on form and back on top of the cooperative economy. Uh, next slide, please. There was the one that should have been in uh, previously. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so just to really reiterate that Cooperatives UK is very much open for business. We can still do our AGMs. We can still give the advice and guidance to our members that 
they require. Um, and we've been doing this for 150 years through through wars, through through pan, through Spanish flus and, uh, and other situations. And really, you know, with all the ups and downs, with all the changes, comings and goings of specific individuals, changes in terminology and technology, Cops UK really does remain steadfast. That you know, that port in the storm through the hard times, and 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 also that rallying call really when we're, we're ready to build back better. And so I'd just like to finish by saying we only exist because of your will and your support. The impacts we make, we make for you. And so I hope you continue to support us through this next period, this next year and future years. And, and really it's a plea to, to continue and don't stop challenging us to do more, to be more, to be better. And I just have to say, I know from this year, the team, who've come through this period are up for that challenge you know we have proven it this year and so continue to support us but also continue to challenge us thank you very much oh yeah and uh course is fortnight just to say we'll be um we'll be showing the video at the end thank you very much Any questions? We do, we do have some questions. So John, we had a question earlier from Harry Kearney from Scott Mid. He asked specifically around the impact um, on current membership retention and the future impact on membership um, as a result of uh, COVID-19. So we'd like to start with that one. Thankfully, our membership runs January to December. So most well, all our members who were going to renew anyway did renew at the start of the year, um, and therefore we won't we won't have the the proof of what happens until next January. Um, and so, really, my response is part gut rather than anything else. Um, I think for a lot of our larger members, uh, not just the retail societies in food retail, but a lot of our large worker cooperatives are also in food wholesale, and so they will be less affected than some of our other sectors i think for our smaller cooperatives particularly the creative industries and the community sectors it will inevitably be tough um what i would say is membership is fairly small what they get for membership i believe is is value for money and for those smaller members who are the most effective affected by the situation to be honest the the level of advice support and guidance they receive from cautious uk uh, of course, I would say this, but I would re recommend they stay in membership so that they can access that advice, support and guidance through what will be uh, a difficult economy and a difficult time for our members. So do I know what the actual effect will be? No, I don't. But I'm hopeful our retention rates will will stand up. Thanks, John. Um, we have um, another question. It's quite um, a long one, but I'm just going to read it. So. How far does the membership of Cooperatives UK and the wider COP movement in the UK reflect the diversity of the UK population? And what actions are we taking to address any structural issues that discriminate against certain parts of the UK population and enabling them to be involved in co-ops? Um, and to significantly improve uh, diversity and inclusion within the cooperative movement. And then last part of that question, how will it monitor diversity and inclusion within Cooperatives UK and the wider court movement in the UK? And that was from Chris Dapps. And that's a great question. We, um, I suppose it's fair to say Cooperatives UK's membership um, and, and staff, we probably do reflect the current cooperative movement. Uh, and I say that with a pause to say that that's not necessarily a good thing, because I don't think the wider cooperative movement or the sorts of cooperatives that are being created out there reflect the broadest and broader community out there. Um, and so we, we have to be honest and hold our hands up to that. What I would say is uh, we're working with Power to Change, one of our funders who are is actually at the moment funding a project across locality Plunkett. Uh, ourselves and, and themselves to look at this exact issue and uh, I was actually on a call earlier today with a consultant who is doing a, a review of not just Corpus UK's policies and procedures around diversity but also uh, looking at what we're doing externally so I although I do not have an answer of 
what we will be doing at the moment, I am very certain that over this next period, Corps UK and the other partner organisations we're working with, like Power to Change, will be coming out with um, some very specific actions as it's been highlighted as, a, as an issue we all want to focus on and, and resource. So I hope that answers, if not the specifics of the question, at least giving you a, a sense of direction for the future. Another question. So uh, with regards to the new force that you mentioned, uh, David Smith asks, what fresh ideas does COPS UK um, see that they will bring to the table? And the second part of the question, how might members be more supportive in developing collaborative and partnership working? I think one of the things we've recognised, if I can be candid, I suppose, is it was quite difficult to do a, a big bang approach to how we collaborate and work with the other organisations through what's been a period of quite a lot of um, change. Both the Cooperative College uh, principal has has moved on and our own chief executive has, has moved on. And so there's actually a lot going on through this period anyway, uh, despite, despite COVID. And so really, as I mentioned before, what we've moved towards is more tactical changes we can do between the organisations on a practical level to support each other, both on cost saving uh, around shared services. And, uh, you know, we uh, most of them are tenants within Hollyoke House, which we we operate. So that on the tactical level around cost savings, we can do to support each other, but also on collaborations externally, we can do to support each other. More than the shop is just one example. Um, other examples which we're, we're actively working on at the moment are, say, for example, I'm working with the Cooperative College on member inductions and how we uh, can run a, a scheme of, of uh, providing basic waters of co-op induction to the cooperative movement um, provided from both Cooperative UK and the college and, and taking that out to the wider co-op movement. So really it's looking at small scale tactical interventions we can do with our, our partner organisations to, to, re to really build those relationships up. I don't know whether Emma's got any more to add on, uh, on that one. No, that's your job today. <laughs> um, we have another question from Heather Richardson. Um, she asks, are you changing the membership approach to reflect the changes in society and behaviours as a result of COVID-19, uh, which could present an opportunity to showcase and promote cooperation? One of the things we are doing at the moment is we've got quite a significant project, a uh, digital project, um, starting with essentially our website so we're doing a complete uh, consolidation of I think up to six different websites we've got uh, into one platform uh, for our website and uh, and also not just website but our, our approach to digital services and digital delivery of our of our what we would call analog services um, and so that project is a large and significant project will be going along for at least up until the end of the year We've also hopefully just uh, recruited a new head of digital um, to oversee the next phase of our uh, of that. And so moving into the future, I'm expecting innovations really to come out of our approach to serving our members through through digital services. And I think that will answer some of our questions around future, essentially future products uh, that we offer to our members. Thank you, John. Um, we currently don't have any more questions. Um, so we, uh, Nick, I'll hand back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Michael and Will. Um, that, that, you know, it's quite, um, it's quite difficult to cover 48 pages of the annual report and accounts uh, in a few minutes. And I thank them for the the way that they've gone about it. Um, I think it's, 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 I think the range and scale of the work that we're doing is fantastic. I would say that, wouldn't I? But I'm on my way out, so I, I can claim all credit for that. But I think also that the way they, you know, we're looking backwards for, to 1919, but if we look to where we are today, I think the work that uh, the digital team have done behind the scenes to enable us to maintain a fully functioning Cooperatives UK uh, from home, basically, from people's sitting rooms, bedrooms and kitchens is absolutely fantastic. I'll just give you one, one small example. We run co-op connections activities around the cities of the UK to bring our members together. 
normally when these take place as physical meetings, you're lucky if you get 20 to 25 people from cooperatives turning up. We've had over 100, 150 people turning up virtually to hang out with us at those, those meetings. So the level of member engagement, and I think this is a good observation from one of our members earlier, uh, is going through, you know, we're learning a lot during COVID-19 about how to do better online member engagement. So I think that something good uh, may well come out of this process. I just also like to make a small brag before I move on to propose the resolution. I'm delighted that my own society, of course, the Heart of England Society, as everybody knows, not only the oldest society in the country, but also the best, uh, and made a £100,000 contribution to the student co-op homes development uh, this year, which was just too late for the last year's accounts. But my board wouldn't forgive me if I hadn't given that pat on the back and that plug at this meeting. So happily, now we are happy to go on to, uh, to move the resolution that we're following the presentations I will formally move that we receive the annual report and financial statements together with the report of the auditors for the year ended the 31st, 31st of December 2019. Can I get a second? Yeah, we have Sally Chicken as a seconder. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sally. The, the, the resolution is before the meeting. More product placement. This is co-op water this time. Absolutely beautiful. Nick, I can confirm that that resolution has been passed and you won't be able to see this, Nick, but we've had quite a few people on the questions um, wanting to pay tribute to you um, in, your, in your standing down as chair. I mean, what have on here from, Nick Ken, uh, from Harry Kearney, um, who uh, wants to pay tribute for all the work you've done for COPS UK and the greater movement um, and the support he has extended to him personally and to Scott Mid. Um, he also um, thanks Ed Mayo as well. Thanks, That's Harry. very kind. That that vote, by the way, was 98% for, uh, which looks a bit like North Korea voting, but never mind, it uh, shows solid support for the work that we've been doing over the last year. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, now we are moving on to the next resolution. And this is a formal process that every AGM has to go through, and that's to app the appointment of auditors. To make the proposal in this case, uh, can, I bring, can I ask Don Morris of the Redoubtable Radstock Cooperative, who is chair of our Audit Risk Committee, to move the resolution? Thank you, Nick. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, formally move resolution three uh, to reappoint KPMG LLP as auditors to hold the office from the conclusion of the meeting until the conclusion of the next annual general meeting. Thank you. Thanks for that formal moving, Don. Has anybody got any questions about that process? It's the Q&A button again. Uh, we do have a question um, from Sean Wellens, who, um, quite a long one, so I can't read all of it, but he's, he's asking, um, why are we still employing KPMG as our auditor? It's an annual question. Um, and Michael, um, please, can I ask you to respond to that? So, um, as I say, um, let me just have a look. Um, yeah, Michael, please yep. can you respond to the question around why we still continue to, to have KPMG as our auditor. I think it'd be unfair to ask Will. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a question we get asked every year and it, every five years it goes out to tender and it went out to tender and they, were the, they, they won the tender. And it'll be up again in 2021, and we'll, you know, we'll we'll go through the same process again. But every, you know, all uh, accounting firms are, you know, entitled to trying to, you know, to get the business. 
Uh, but they, you know, they won the tender, and that's why we use them. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Sean, hopefully that uh, answers um, answers your question. Um, obviously, if you've got any more qu uh, questions on that, then do um, do pop them back in the in the question and answer. Um, Heather Richardson has asked uh, again, Michael, one for you, I think, just a um, question of, of facts. How long has KPMG been the auditor? Well, I've only been here 20 years, and they've been 20 years, but there's always been a rolling tender process. So it's over 20 years, but I can't, I don't know how further back they go. It's probably before they were even. Um, a question, another question from uh, Sean Wellens related to that question that we've, um, that we've just had. Uh, will we include ethical and social values criteria in our next tender process? Michael? I don't know, to be honest. We've not, we've not written it yet, but obviously we'll give it consideration, obviously. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we can agree today that we can include that in our, yeah. in our material when we, uh, when we do the next tender process, for sure. Um, Chris Dabbs has asked the question, in future, um, I guess this is also about criteria, should we ask that the um, auditor should also be required to hold the fair tax mark? Michael. I mean, it's not, it's not a requirement and I don't know if any auditors have got it. So, I mean, we can, we can put it on as a, you know, as a recommendation, but, you know, I mean, we don't know who's got it in terms of accounting firms anyway. Mm. We can so, always ask. Yeah, in the tender process, we have certain things, obviously, that are desirable and other things that are essential. So, again, I guess we could include that as a desirable requirement in future um, when, we, when we tender. Um, a, a question from Heather Richardson. So, going forward, will we consider best practice in rotation of auditors in the next um, tender? No, we are, we've do, we do do best practice. Yeah, we we do already follow that in terms of the the rotation of um, of audit head partners. Well, audit partners. partners. Yeah. Um, David Smith asks, uh, Michael or, or Don, uh, but does Michael see any advantage in changing our auditor? on a periodic basis? I think you might already have answered that, but if you want to. Um, the partners rotated and, you know, we deal with a lot of staff at the at the um, auditors anyway. So, I mean, sometimes it's, they know how we, they know what we do as well. So sometimes you spend a lot of time teaching them what we actually do before they can do the audit. But, you know, I mean, we, we, we do get a rotation of, it's not just the partner that does the work, there is other people involved. Um, so we, we have another question from John Boyle, but does the tender ask include social accountability um, <clears throat> and good governance should change accountants uh, regularly? Um, yeah, as we've confirmed, we do, uh, we do a tender at least every 10 years as is required and the audit partner does change every five years as, re as required. And we can certainly look at social accountability in terms of the audit criteria uh, when we... When we um, the next audit retender, which will be in uh, in a couple of years. <clears throat> um, we have another question. Um, after the this is from Harry Kearney. So after the criticism on the big four audit companies, um, did we have did Carts UK have a suitable conversation with KPMG to satisfy themselves um, that KPMG had acted on some of the criticisms that they received at that time from government? Uh, Don, perhaps you could take that one. We'll give you a minute, Don. Okay. Ryan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, we did. Um, in terms of um, acting on the criticism, we had a, a long review as a board uh, and, um, and obviously made sure that uh, we were happy with the uh, KPMG in terms of our audit. As we said, we, we did undertake a really comprehensive audit retender process back in 2015. And we and our members agreed to reappoint KPMG as they were the best firm for the job. And they were best able to support the services we need. Um, we obviously keep that under uh, appointment under review. 
and the audit committee will look at uh, an audit tendering process in uh, in due course. So hopefully, yes, we have got that got that reassurance, and it's something that we will be keeping uh, an eye on. Thank you, Don. Um, we we have another another question from Heather Richardson, um, a follow up question from her previous one. Uh, that best practice considers change of audit company every 10 years, not just change of partner. Um, so, yeah, if I didn't make that clear earlier, we, we re-tender every 10 years um, and then audit partner changes at least every five years. Um, and the tender, the, the brief that went out absolutely did go out beyond the big four um, for consideration when we did it back in 2015. Um, I can't yeah, it, it went it went wider than that, and certainly we did get um, a couple of expressions of interest from from others. Um, so yeah, we we absolutely um, follow best practice in terms of audit retender. Does anyone else have any more questions to either Michael or Don before we move to the vote? Don't think so. I'll pass back over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues, for all those pertinent questions. Uh, I just wanted to add one little rider to this discussion. Uh, the relationship we've got with uh, the, particularly the KPMG in Manchester uh, is very, very long standing. It's not just about audit. Um, even before it was KPMG, when it was Pete Warwick, uh, they had a very close relationship with the cooperative movement. And the work that we require to get done is way beyond, if it was just auditing a, a three million pound turnover business, uh, we could get anybody uh, to be able to do that. But the kind of work uh, and, and support work we have been uh, relying on them to help us with is things like when we seek to challenge international accounting standards, when we're trying to establish accounting standards uh, for, the, for the country that affect cooperatives, it, unfortunately, in the present climate, you do need a relationship with one of the bigger um, accountancy businesses to be able to have that level of influence. Uh, I, I fully understand and appreciate, however, that, uh, and I think all of us do uh, in business generally, that the performance of the large audit firms has been atrocious over the last decade. And uh, I think this is something that we'll have to come back to. And I'm sure that will be reflected when Don uh, um, uh, looks at the uh, process for tender uh, when we go forward uh, next year. So colleagues at the moment, I need um, um, to formally, we need, Don has formally uh, moved the uh, resolution that we reappoint KPMG as our auditors. Is there a seconder? Yeah, I confirm that Elaine Dean is seconded that resolution. Thank you very much, Elaine. The resolution is now on the screen for you to cast your votes. Thank you, I confirm uh, that resolution has been passed. Thank you very much for that vote, colleagues. Can I just say that we, whilst that, you know, that is a, the against is only 14%, I think that that's, that's quite a significant, um, you know, mark, and we will endeavour to take forward the concerns of members when we look into this matter in the future. So thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on. Uh, thank you for that. Thank to Will, thanks. Uh, Don, uh, for your contributions. Uh, resolution four. Um, this is uh, for our board fees. Now, technically, we don't have to do this, but because we believe in transparency and we encourage other societies to do it, can I ask Ross Hudson, Chair of our Remuneration Appointments and Concession Committee, to propose the next resolution?
4, which is about their board fee. Um, so I'll read out their resolution 4, which is about the board fee. Um, in line with our policy for members to approve annual RPI increases to board fees, but the board fee increase from £1,670 to £1,712, and the chair's fee increase from £5,090 to £5,217 from the 1st of July 2020. Thanks, Ross. We're now looking for a formal seconder. Oh, before we have a seconder, of course, has anybody got any questions? Getting ahead of myself, I was thinking of all that juicy Luca. Are there any questions, Emma, on the board fees? No, we don't have any questions, so I think we can just move to the vote. I hope that shows that they think we're worth it, perhaps it does. Ross has proposed a resolution. Can we have a seconder for that resolution, please? Yeah, we have Liam McLeod. Oh, excellent. Thank you very, very much. That, that uh, motion is before you then, colleagues. Time to vote. Just do a bit more product placement. I'm moving on to Co-op and Brent Lager now. So you'll be pleased to know because it's getting towards the end of the meeting. Nick, just well, just before we share the poll results, uh, or we do just have a question that came through a little bit later from. Uh, okay. It won't make a difference to the results, but it might be useful for members to hear the question. So this will just go to Ross. Um, are there any plans to move away from RPI? Um, I think the short answer is that there aren't any firm plans to do that. Um, to move away from the RPI increase. Um, certainly it's something we could discuss. Uh, we've got a meeting in a month in terms of, you know, it might seem like a, a nominal thing in this meeting, but you know, you don't want to dismiss when you're talking about director remuneration um, and whether, you know, you, you do want to keep having that increase, but no, it's not something we've discussed at this point, but certainly happy to have a look at it. Thank you. Thanks Ross. Um, so I can confirm that the, the resolution was passed. Yeah, nobody against. That was uh, NEMCON, I think is the technical word for that one. Thank you very much, Ross. That's great news. Thanks for everybody for that vote. Uh, next item is from Emma. We're gonna, just going to explain to you the comings and goings. Uh, Emma, can you provide us an update following the recent director elections and appointments? What the shape of the board will be look like uh, following this annual general meeting. I can. So this year we uh, three board seats were due for elections. So they were in the categories of enterprise owned cooperatives, mixed owned cooperatives and retail consumer cooperatives, which was the national seat. The results are as follows. In the mixed ownership cooperatives, that was an uncontested election and see Cheryl Barrett on behalf of the cooperative party being re-elected to the board. From the Retail Consumer Cooperative's national seat, another uncontested election, that sees Don Morris from Radstock Co-op Society re-elected for a further three years. We did have a contested election in the enterprise-owned category, and that sees Martin Johnson from Bradford Cooperative Association elected to the board. The result in the enterprise-owned election category means that John Chilcott did not, replace, uh, did not retain his place on the board. So on behalf of the board, I would like to offer thanks uh, to John for his service um, to the board and its subcommittees over the last six years, and we wish him best wishes for the future. Um, in appointed seats, uh, Paul Singh, uh, on behalf of Central England, has sat on the board for six years. Uh, he indicated his wish to stand down um, earlier this year, and as a result, we are pleased to welcome Tanya Noon as the new uh, Central England appointment. 
Again, on behalf of the board, please uh, may I offer thanks to, to Paul for his service. There was one final election, um, which was the Worthy Carl Council. Uh, Ross, Ross Hodgson was successful in his re-election to the Worthy Carl Council, and so he retains his seat on the Coptus UK board. Uh, we await the results of the Cork Group Member Council elections, which have been slightly delayed, um, and so we'll know their appointment in early July. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to express my own personal thanks uh, to the work that Paul Singh and John, Kil John Chilcott have done whilst they've been on the board, uh, two outstanding cooperators, and I have to say, over that time, have become personal friends. So I'd very much like to thank them for their contribution to COPS UK over that period. Uh, warm welcome to Martin and to Tanya, who will be joining the board. Now, you, you may not be aware of this fully, uh, but in terms of the timetables of our elections, we brought forward, the, because we, we, we're in an internet room with a CEO, uh, we brought forward the election of the chair uh, so that the chair would be in place uh, at, at this meeting. Normally what happens is the election is the first of the chair is the first meeting uh, after the annual general meeting, which means there's a bit of an integrum. So to make sure that we had a, a, you know, a fully functioning team and we were properly representative whilst we were without a chief executive, uh, we brought forward that election. Now, why we did that was because it's it's the end of my term of office as chair. Uh, I'd like to say to colleagues and friends, being chair of Cooperatives UK has been for me the greatest honour of my life. To represent and to support the work of Cooperatives UK and to represent the wider cooperative movement is the greatest honour I have ever had and I am so proud to be able to carry out that function. I have had such fantastic support from boards uh, of all of the big societies and smaller societies, from my own board at Cooperatives UK, from my own board at the Heart of England Cooperative Society. Uh, I've been truly blessed. The team I've had to work with at Cooperatives UK have been man and woman, every last one of them have been absolutely outstanding and have gone beyond anything required uh, to fulfill their functions on behalf of cooperatives. They are absolutely wonderful people. And I feel like, you know, they're part of a family, not just part of a business organization. It's been a truly uh, fantastic experience for me. And I'm absolutely delighted that in that election, uh, I, I will be replaced as chair of Cooperatives UK by somebody who I know has the same level of passion for the organization, the same level of commitment, and has the same level of dedication to cooperatives as I do, and that's Don Morris, the Chief Executive Officer of the Radstock Cooperative Society. So congratulations to you, Don, and I, I'm absolutely chuffed to bits to be able to pass in the baton to somebody who I know will carry it with dignity and will carry forward the work of Cooperatives UK uh, in the best possible way. Don, congratulations to you. And goodbye to Paul and John, and welcome to Tanya and to Martin. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, that was a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, Nick, uh, I'm going to say a few words about you. I've been given a couple of minutes and I'd just like to say something with you. And I know members present uh, it, it, on the meeting have made it clear that they would like uh, to acknowledge your contribution over the years to Cooperatives UK. Nick joined the Board of Cooperatives UK eight years ago and has been chair for the last six years. So obviously his talent was spotted early in his board career. Now Nick will continue as vice chair for the next year. So we're saying goodbye to him as chair, but he certainly will be around as vice chair. And we thank him for doing this as it will bring continuity and stability in a time of change for Cooperatives UK. I've got to say that I have rarely known someone as knowledgeable or as passionate about cooperation and cooperative model. I've learned and will continue to learn a great deal from him. He is a softly spoken encyclopedic knowledge on all that is co-op. One of my first memories of Nick 
is at the Birmingham Congress back in 2011, I believe, when Nick took to the stage and educated us all on yam yams, which I know uh, is a per now know is a person from the Black Country, which is in the West Midlands, very close to Birmingham. Now the Black Country Dalek is very unique, and yam yam derives from yuam, as in yam coming with me. And that's my apologies for that. That's my best. Uh, that's my best uh, 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 go at that uh, accent. Um, Nick went on to explain that there was also yim yams from Coventry. But that's another story uh, for another time and best that Nick explains that one. I knew that working alongside Nick was going to be both educational and entertaining and I've got not been a bit disappointed and I'm sure that all of you who've had the pleasure of working with Nick will also agree. And Nick is becoming the best known for his action on Twitter and I've never seen anyone so prolific. I would like to thank Nick on behalf of Cooperative UK board and the staff team for his commitment and his unwavering support. He has been a wonderful chair and asset to Cooperative UK and I'm honoured to take on the position of chair from him. Thank you, Nick. Just remember that we forgot to tell you all the results of the ballot vote. It was going so well. So I'm just going to interrupt Nick here just to, <laughs> just to give you the results. Um, we needed a two thirds majority, which we have received. Uh, we had two abstentions and the rest of the votes were all in favour. So thank you very much um, for that. Um, I'll pass you back over to Nick. Who is muted. Nick, you're muted. Th thanks very much, Emma. Thank you for reminding us of that formal business that we have to undertake to make sure that we continue uh, our work as Cooperatives UK. Can I thank all the members who've attended uh, this meeting online? Uh, can I thank uh, all the staff and the board of Cooperatives UK who have done all the work that's made this uh, annual uh, meeting possible and the work possible? Can I make a special thank you to Paul Murphy, who's our head, or it will be our, now our outgoing head of comms. Paul has been a, 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 a genius uh, behind the scenes in terms of our technology. Paul's going off to do a PhD at the University of Cardiff. So Cardiff's gain is our loss. He did explain to me the other day what his PhD was about. Uh, but as we've only got a few minutes left in the meeting and I, 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 I won't have time to be able to explain it to you, but it's pretty damn clever and it's, it's a very smart piece of work on, uh, on, on computing that is taken on there. The Festival of Cooperation originally planned for our 150th anniversary this year will hopefully take place over the same weekend next year. This is a free event. It will be showcasing a diverse range of co-ops to raise awareness of co-ops and celebrate Watchtail as the home of cooperation. We'll also bring back, I'm delighted to say, the Co-op of the Year Awards, which have been such great fun over the last few years, and celebrate the wonderful variety of cooperatives and cooperators we have in our country. It's fair to say that it's been a troubling time, and there's probably going to be quite a deep recession coming. So all of us have got to work together to cooperate in solidarity to support one another in this time. Uh, I think the cooperative values and principles that underpin cooperative enterprises have absolutely come to the fore in the last few months. I've probably seen more spontaneous cooperation in the last three or four months than in the previous five years. That underlying values have shown, I think, to the British public, the true value of cooperative enterprise, big and small, have gone beyond uh, what anybody could have expected in terms of delivering value and delivering services and delivering goods to their customers and members and to serve in the communities in which they sit. So I don't think that it's any, um, any surprise to me that that's the case, but hopefully lots of new people uh, in our country will realise the true value of cooperative enterprise. We'll be signing off with a sneak peek of our Carp Fortnight film as you know, it's coming soon, it's coming soon. Co-op Fortnite is coming soon. And we're encouraging everybody to keep cooperating. So hopefully we'll see you all in the flesh very soon. And it's good night from me. And good luck. And have a great co-op fortnight.
When the world ground to a halt, we kept key workers moving. We've kept our stores open and our shelves well stocked. Hi guys, hope you're all keeping safe. Today we're going to be making potato, drop scones, chickpea and pineapple curry. We've been looking after our family and yours. Because even when we're apart, we together. We're helping to build a better future from the rubble of this crisis. And showing the world what working together can do. As cooperatives, we know what it means to work together to build a better society. It's in our DNA, every day. And it's in yours too. We've all seen what happens when we cooperate. So let's keep cooperating. Goodbye, everybody. I'm going off to drink some Goodwill gin. Hooray! From the wonderful Glen Rivis Distillery in Scotland. Corporation in a bottle. Thanks to everybody who contributed to sending me this. I'm absolutely chuffed to bits. Thank you very much. Salute.